We want to make the most of our time together today. Um, 90 minutes sounds like a lot, but as all of you know from Zoom over the past couple of years, it, it actually tends to go by pretty fast when we have such a fascinating subject as we do today. Um, so welcome. We're here at the fifth and final installation of our California Farm Demonstration Network Nitty Gritty on California Soils uh, program. And you can see uh, we are excited and, and so happy to um, feature Daniel Rath today. He'll be speaking about using genetic testing of soil organisms to understand biological diversity in the soil with respect to soil health, pest management, nutri nutrient cycling, and more. If you're interested, um, in reviewing the last four of this five-part series. You can find that on our website, which Jennifer will put in the chat. Uh, each of the webinars is about an hour, an hour and a half long and cover a wide range of topics related to soil function, um, soil health, et cetera. So we definitely invite you to check that out. Um, my name is Hannah and I am the program manager for Agriculture and Watersheds at California um, Association of Resource Conservation Districts. I'm also the program manager for a network called the California Farm Demonstration Network, which I'll speak more about in a moment. Um, but again, we're just really excited uh, to have had the opportunity in large part, thank you to um, California Department of Food and Ag for the funding to be able to put on this series for you. And while we are sad to see um, these five webinars uh, come and go, we're excited to be rolling out additional programming from the network, ideally later this year. So um, what is the California Farm Demonstration Network? Basically our goal is among um, farmers, growers, ranchers, and um, uh, some entities that I will post on the screen in a moment. We're looking to increase adoption of water, climate, and nutrient smart systems through participatory learning, learning and showcasing of innovative systems. We're trying to do this in a hyper-local um, but well-connected way where we can have grower-to-grower -grower conversations and the support entities um, that partner with them there and we are doing our best to collect that information. Um, and uh, as you see on the screen, sort of do it all individually, but come together and share learnings and um, make connections, foster relationships so that we can all continue our, our forward motion. So um, the California Farm Demonstration Network is a partnership between the entities that you see at the bottom of the screen, but really we are nothing without the farmers, growers, and ranchers all across the state who work with each one of us, um, each one of the entities here, and all of our advisors and um, staff and boots on the ground that uh, connect and field questions, um, support implementation, monitoring um, every day. So, if you would like to learn more about the California Farm Demonstration Network, um, again, you can check out the website that uh, Jennifer has posted in the chat for the past videos, but just two more slides on who we are and what we've been up to. We're in the process of building a California Farm Demonstration Network website that ideally will be launching in full force later this year. Many of you may have helped us with the beta testing of the current site, um, and we are excited to be able to publish uh, a near final version in the next couple of months, um, leveraging your great feedback and um, ideally um, posting publicly uh, many of the great events that have taken place since this first iteration of the site 
Um, hi, everyone. Just double checking. Um, I think it may just have been Hannah's. Um, oh, yeah, I think her connection cut out. Oh, no. Can everyone hear me? Well, while we wait, yes, we can hear you, Daniel. This is Karen Lowell. I am um, an agronomist with USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. And I'm working together with CARCD on the California Farm Demonstration Network. While we wait for Hannah to come back and finish discussing a little bit more about that, I'll just quick run through. I'm going to moderate the question and answer session that follows Daniel's presentation. So let me just run through how we hope to use that. Um, time in our presentation today. So Daniel's going to offer us some sort of key information about how we might use metagenomics to understand, characterize what's happening in our soils and how we might understand it in thinking about management of our soils and evaluating that management. But really what we want to dive into is what we've done in the previous sessions of this webinar series, which is allow what you want to think about um, with regard to Daniel's information for your practical use or your research interests or whatever it is that brought you to the webinar, we purposely keep the presentation portion relatively short and that gives us a chance to make this a session that is the, the greatest practical value for people like yourselves. So to do that, what we have done successfully in the past is use the chat to drop your questions in as they occur to you. Or right now, if there's something you're hoping Daniel's going to address, drop it in the chat right away. I will organize that information so that when we get to the Q&A, we're ready to dive right in. So we're not really aiming for a brain dump by a super smart scientist, which definitely Daniel is, but what we're aiming for is to help him um, get feedback too, because he's launching his professional life and it's a feedback loop. It's only as good as we all collectively make it in sharing information and needs. So please um, understand I'm not, the only thing I would interrupt Daniel for would be is if somebody says, wait a minute, I didn't understand that word or something of that nature, but otherwise we'll hold the questions and discussion till the end. But just drop your stuff, uh, your questions, um, your comments, your interests, straight into the chat and I will organize it. And now I'm gonna hand it back to Hannah who appears to have unfrozen to let her finish what she was doing. And then she'll hand it back to Daniel when it's time. Thanks. Okay, sorry about that everybody. Of course your internet goes up when you're presenting to uh, a lot of people. So, um, just one final slide on uh, what the California Farm Demonstration Network uh, has been up to with this first sort of uh, instance of our, our being um, is we have funded four hubs. Um, thanks again in, in generosity to, to California Department of Food and Ag to essentially stand up um, concentrated farm demonstration events over the past two years. Um, each of these four hubs in these um, localities across the state, um, each completed five events. And those are the exact sorts of events that you will see um, featured on this website when uh, we launch it again later this year. So just um, a little piece to tempt your interest when you see us blast this website in the next couple of months. So thank you so much to the great hubs and their work and the growers and farmers that um, made all of those demonstration events possible. I attended a couple of the um, webinars, one when it was happening and watched a recording of them and they are fantastic. So definitely um, make sure you check those out on the website when it becomes available. So last piece of just housekeeping, um, if any of you are CCAs and you would like some CEUs from participating today, um, you can go ahead and download the app if you don't already have it. And we will flash the QR code at the conclusion of this event. You can go ahead and scan it and um, get your, um, your uh, CEU credits that way. If for some reason you can't uh, download the app, feel free to reach out to myself or Jennifer Wood and we will ensure that you get the credits that you came for. Incidentally, if you have to leave early, that's also what I would ask that you do is just get in touch with us and we can make sure that we give you your credits. Um, did you already do the poll while I was not on internet? We did okay. not. 
Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, we have a couple polls for the audience today, just so we can understand who's here and tailor our information and our questioning as much as possible. So if everyone could just take 10 seconds to let us know who you are, what's your background? Are you a grower? Are you a researcher, technical assistant, um, policy? Do you work in policy? Are you a program manager or other administrative uh, personnel um, or other? And if you do select other, please go ahead and um, enter what role you play in the chat if you're comfortable doing so. So maybe just two more seconds on this and then Jennifer will close it and we'll see who's here. Okay, so it looks like we are overwhelmingly um, uh, graced with the presence of TA folks today, which is excellent. I think that this presentation will be super applicable to your work. Uh, we have good representation from folks in the policy side um, and a lot of others. So again, if you feel comfortable, let us know what other means to you. Um, and fewer growers. Uh, so we will have to make sure we get this content out to growers if and when it is appropriate. Um, the second poll that we wanted to do just again before we kick things off with Daniel is just to understand, have you ever done a soil metagenome test? Yes, no, I've thought about it, but haven't done it. Just take maybe five seconds to answer. We may have needed, do you know what one is? That would also be a good question. <laughs> Jennifer, um, can we have the results? Okay, so no. So most people uh, have not, which may mean, Karen, to your point, that people don't necessarily know what it is. So we will definitely, we can guarantee by the end of this presentation, you will at least know what it is. and. Uh, we will be circling back and asking about your intentions to pursue this test um, at the conclusion of today's presentation. So um, that will be the poll three that we ask you at the end, how likely you are. So just to let you know what's to come. So I will go ahead and stop sharing. And I think uh, Karen filled in for me while I was having technical difficulties and already said her piece. So I think, um, is that right, hosts? We can go ahead with Daniel. Launch the boy, yeah. All right, let's do it. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here and really looking forward to today's presentation. Okay, I think that is my sign to take it away. And I will. So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Daniel Rath. Uh, if you didn't read the bio on the website, I'm a PhD candidate uh, in the UC Davis Soil and Biogeochemistry program. I work with Dr. Kate Scow in the Scow Soil Microbial Ecology Lab. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about genetic testing of the soil and what we can learn from it, what it's useful for, and what it is, so we have a good idea. Um, the title is a little bit long, uh, Using Genetic Testing of Soil Organisms to Understand Biological Diversity in the Soil, Soil Health, Health Management, Nutrient Cycling, and More, Everything But the Kitchen Sink. I think that a sort of uh, more succinct summary of this seminar would be how does testing soil genomes work and what can we learn from it. And I'm going to cover all of the areas mentioned in the title, but this is just like a, you know, if you want like a one line takeaway, this is what this presentation is going to be about. I'm going to split it into two parts. The first one is where I talk about how soil genetic testing works, what is some of the science behind it. I'm going to use a liberal dose of metaphor to try and get my point across. And then what I'm going to talk about the second part is what we use these tests for, what are useful results that we can get from them, what can they tell us about our soil, um, that kind of stuff. So for those of you that don't know what a soil genetic test is, basically there are a number of companies that have sprung up in the last several years that say, send me your soil, send me a sample of your soil, and we will look at the microbes in that soil and we will tell you about like how they are doing and it will give you ideas on what you need to do for management. If you know, this is a sample report that you might get from one of these companies. 
Um, and you can see here, you know, well, 29% of your area has a high risk of fusarium wilt if you plant lettuce. 83% has a high risk if you plant strawberries. Looks like there are some scores for organic matter and nutrient cycling at the bottom. Those, you know, numbers seem to be close to 100, so that's probably good. There's a scale here for aerobicity and aggregation, which are good, right? It's good if you have aggregation in soil. Pollution is low, so that's probably also good. What I'm going to talk about is where this information comes from, if you've never interacted with it before, and what it really is useful for. Because if you look at something like this, you might say, wow, this is, this is incredible. I have a really great idea of like what the diseases are going to be, so it'll tell me what to plant. And it's not quite that simple. So really when we do these soil genetic tests the whole point of doing them the reason we want to ask you know to, to, to test the genes in the soil is that we basically want the ability to talk to the microbes we want to listen to what they are saying because the microbes that exist in the soil have a really good idea of the conditions that are there it would be really convenient if we could pick up a handful of soil and hold it to your ear and the microbes would whisper to you and be like oh we need more nitrogen um, unfortunately, microbes don't speak English, and so we need a translation service. We need to try and find some other way to interpret what they're saying. The way we do that is by looking at their DNA. So we look at the instructions that these microbes use to interact with the environment. And when I talk about it, you know, I've used the term metagenome before, and genome, a genome is the all the DNA from one organism. A metagenome is all the DNA in a particular soil sample. So when I'm talking, you know, these reports that look at, you know, fusarium mills and charcoal rot and uh, nutrient cycling, they look at all of the microbial DNA in a soil sample, and they try to interpret that to give you an idea of what is happening in your soil. Now, you know, they, it's hard to talk about DNA without going a little bit into like, how we look at DNA. And the basic gist of looking at any type of DNA is that we take DNA, we translate it into a series of letters, A, C, T, G, and then we compare that to a database so that we can make an educated guess about who that DNA is from and what they do. If you take DNA from a random sample anywhere on earth, you have no idea where it's from, no idea what ecosystem it's from, you just have this piece of DNA and you need to figure out what it's trying to tell you. The first step is to compare that DNA to a database of DNA sequences that you know, we have built over the last few decades. What happens is in that database are a lot of other sequences. And attached to each of those sequences is a little label. And it's like, well, taken from an alligator, taken from a squirrel, taken from a tree in Joshua Tree National Park. We compare our unknown DNA to that list of other sequences and we look for similarities. Sometimes you get really lucky. You're like, oh, I was looking in the crocodile folder and it looks like my DNA matches really well with the, the DNA of like crocodiles or it could be alligators because they're so similar, but you know, it's something between the two of those. The other way to look at, to do that database comparison is to look at the individual genes inside that DNA sequence. So if I look at my DNA sequence and I say, hey, I see genes for scales and I see a gene for teeth and I see a gene for tails and I see a gene for eyes, that is probably an indication that this might be a predator. When we get this data, we get this idea of who is there and what they do. We try to put those together to draw a conclusion about the place that DNA came from. So if I had this DNA sample and, I, and it was very similar to either crocodile or alligator DNA, and it had genes for scales and teeth and a tail, I would be like, mm, okay. The conclusion I want to draw from that is that this ecosystem is not really a good place to go swimming. That's how we would look at one DNA sample. However, soil is very diverse. You're not just looking at one DNA sample, you're looking at several. So how do you get these metagenome reports or how do you use these soil genetic tests that look at a lot of different organisms? 
And I'm going to use a metaphor to explain it, which is that it's like putting a zoo in a blender and then you're trying to figure out what each animal was and what it ate. So let's assume that we have a very small zoo. We have five animals. We, you know, we have no idea what the animals are, but we are going to try and figure out what they are using metagenomics. The first thing we do is to put the, those animals in a blender. The, what this is representing is that it is really hard to get DNA out of soil. Um, soil is very sticky. And so in order to, and you know, the DNA is inconveniently located inside microbial cells. And so we want that DNA out of the cells. We don't want it stuck to the soil. And we have found this very high tech method of getting DNA out of soil is that you stick the soil in a blender. Um, we stick it in a little tube that has a lot of beads in it. We add some chemical help and we basically shake that tube really quickly. And those beads will bust up all the soil structure. They'll bust open the cells. What you get is this liquid that hopefully has a lot of DNA inside it. Now, one of the aggravating things about a blender is that it chops things up into smaller pieces. Unfortunately, it does the same thing to the DNA. And so we do not end up with these nice, you know, complete packages of like DNA that represent each of the organisms we're trying to learn about. We end up with these random pieces kind of scattered all over the place. And we have to try and figure out you know, if we want to tell anything about the organisms we're sampling, we have to try and put it back together. If you would like an approximation of the difficulty of doing this, I invite you, take five 1,000 piece puzzles, place them in a large box, do not look at the covers, throw them away, blindfold yourself, and try and put the original puzzles back together by seeing how the shape feels in your fingers. That's a pretty good approximation of how difficult it is to reassemble these genomes after we have like put them in the blender. Now, these soil genetic tests have become more popular in the last 20 to 30 years. And the reason for that is that we've had massive advances in computing power. We've had massive advances in the algorithms that are able to put these genomes together. And so now we're actually able to do that sort of hellish puzzle reconstruction using very powerful computers. The problem is, is that the computers do not always get it right. And so, you know, there's a lot of pieces that can be left out. There's DNA sequences that just didn't make it in. There's some that got destroyed. And so and the computer just, you know, it reassembled some that were like, looked kind of similar, but weren't quite a good fit. And so what we get out of that reconstruction is something that looks like this. So we can say, all right, well, that first creature, probably an alligator. You know, we have a lot of the pieces that looks pretty good. The second one, uh, you know, it might be an alligator, it might be a crocodile, but that's close enough. Um, this one, we don't have a lot of pieces. We're just going to say it's probably a primate. This is definitely a squirrel. This is colorful. It looks like a bird, probably a tropical bird. That's about the same level of resolution that we get when we look at the soil metagenome. You'll get a couple organisms that have like a beautiful, you have their entire genome. You can be like, ah, I know exactly what that is. Um, there's a really good match in the database. There are a lot of other organisms that you're like, okay, I have, I'm like 60% sure that this is what it is. I'm like 40% sure that this is what it is. And that kind of contributes to like the uncertainty associated with these tests. Except it's not even this simple. This is just five organisms. Soil is one of the most diverse habitats on the planet. There might be between 500 to 100,000 species in a teaspoon of soil, half a mile of fungal hyphae. If you took all of that genetic information and printed it out, you would make a pile of books the size of the Great Pyramid of Giza. Um, that is in one, one teaspoon of soil. To put it in another way, uh, to put it in you know, another form, the total amount of DNA in that teaspoon of soil is six times 10 to the 15th base pairs. The total amount of DNA in GenBank, which is the database that we compare that soil samples to, is 100 times smaller. So there's 100 times more DNA in a single tiny soil sample than there is in the database that we use to interpret all of these soil samples from all over the world. So it's no wonder 
that we get a lot of things wrong. A lot of stuff does not get put together properly, or there's just a lot of data that we just don't know who it belongs to. That's basically how we look at soil metagenomes. We take a soil sample, we stick it in the blender, we extract the DNA. We use a computer to put that DNA back together. We compare that DNA to a database, and we try to make a really good guess about who the DNA is from. And we look for specific genes that are associated with functions that we care about. So if I took a soil sample, I put it through that and I saw, okay, there's a lot of Pseudomonas and Rhizopus, which are you know, bacterial um, classes. And I see a lot of genes associated with carbon breakdown and some associated with denitrification. The conclusion that I would try to draw from that data is that this soil has higher potential to break down carbon than other soils. Please note that I said the word potential. Just because a piece of DNA is in the soil does not mean that that is an accurate indication of what the soil can do. And I think that is one of the main issues with reports such as this one. If you look at this, oh, go ahead. Um, if you look at this, what you'll, you know, you, you might be tempted just receiving a report from one of these soil metagenome sequencing organizations is that, wow, there's a really high chance of charcoal rot. I should definitely not plant strawberries this year, but I, I have pretty good nutrient cycling and I have pretty good, um, you know, aerobicity and you know, my aggregation is okay. It's really hard to make clear rec management recommendations from that DNA information, just knowing how uncertain it is. There are so many interactions between organisms in the soil. Yeah, you might have a lot of genes associated with charcoal rot, but you know, there, you know, in, in papers that are looking at whether that means that you're going to have disease incidents, there's there's no connection between them. There might be organisms that suppress that charcoal rot that we don't know about. So you actually, you know, you don't have a high chance of having a particular disease. There might be particular, you know, that might, that DNA might be from charcoal rot organisms that died a long time ago. DNA sticks around in the soil for a long time. And so when you look at these metagenome reports, it's really important that you take them with a grain of salt. There are several caveats. The main one is that you cannot say that the presence of a gene means the soil can do something. You only can say that it has the potential to do something. Genes are like those instruction books that you get from Ikea. And if you've ever gotten something from Ikea, you know at the back of the instruction book is like a bunch of instructions that you didn't use. And there are a whole bunch of parts that you did not use. When we look at the soil DNA, we're looking at the entire instruction book for microbes. We're looking at what they would do if they had low water. We were looking at what they would do if they had high calcium. Just because a gene is present does not mean that something is going to happen. DNA sticks around for a long time. When our organ DNA is a very stable molecule. That's why we store all of our genetic information in it. And so when an organism dies, its DNA can stick around the soil. There's no way to tell that apart. So there's no clear indication that the DNA that you're getting in your soil sample is from a living organism. And as I've highlighted before, the extraction and sequencing and assembly process misses a lot of microbes. There's a potential for mislabeling a lot of things. And that's, you know, anyone who has measured soil samples will know that that's on top of the main issue that you have with soil samples is that it's really hard to interpret whether results are good or bad for a particular soil. If you have ever sampled a California soil where, and tried to do soil health measurements on them and tried to you know, rate them using a scale that was made in the Midwest, you'll see all the California soils are like way on the bottom of the scale. We just don't have the same conditions. That doesn't mean the soils are bad. Like they're quite, you know, California, San Joaquin Valley is one of the most productive agricultural regions in the world. It just means it's really hard to interpret results because every soil is different, every soil Metagenome is different. Every soil has a different mix of organisms. So I've spent all of this time talking about these soil genetic tests. 
and all of the caveats associated with them and all of the ways in which this data can go wrong. So now I'm going to step back and talk about what are the ways that we can actually use this data? What are the ways in which this is actually quite useful? The main thing to highlight here is that these soil genetic tests can help you in interpreting other soil measurements, but they are not a replacement. We have a lot of experience interpreting soil measurements such as pH, such as potentially mineralizable nitrogen, such as nitrogen availability. Those give you a much better idea of what is going on in the soil than looking at the DNA. So it's important that you don't, you know, I think one thing that I have heard when people talk about it is that, oh, I've done this test, so I don't need to do other tests. That is not, you know, that's not the best way to look at it. The best way to look at it is to remember, you are talking to the microbes. You're trying to ask them what is happening in the soil. And microbes can perform one of two functions when they respond to you. They can either be whistleblowers. They can give you an idea of what you need to keep an eye out for. And they can be historians. They can give you a really good idea of how a soil has changed through time. How have my management practices affected the soil microbial community? And I'm going to go into both of those using sort of specific examples. So the first one is for microbes as whistleblowers. And I'm going to use the example of soil pests. We, you know, this is our metagenome workflow. This is how we get the data out of the, the soil metagenome. We take our soil sample, we stick it in the blender, we extract the DNA, we put it back together, and then we compare it to a database. Oh no, I have fusarium wilt genes in my metagenome. Does this mean that 29% of my land has a high chance of a fusarium outbreak if I grow lettuce this year? Well, really what the data says is that 29% of your land has a high incidence of fusarium wilt genes. But that does not mean that you're going to have a high chance of a fusarium wilt outbreak. Like I said, DNA is potential. And there's a large gap between the potential of DNA being translated into action. It's interactions with other microbes in the soil. It's interactions with environmental conditions. A much more reasonable interpretation of a soil metagenome test that gives you a result of like a lot of these genes is that, hey, a fusarium wilt infestation is possible. And if I spot symptoms, I should definitely test for it. So they give you an idea. These microbes, when you talk to them, they'll give you an idea of like, you know, maybe this is something you, th you should think about. Another way that they can talk to you is telling you how your land management has had an effect. And this is something that we looked at at Russell Ranch, which is a long-term agricultural experiment here in Davis. We had about 20 years of management um, between 1993 and 2012, and we compared two systems to see how they had changed over time. One of those systems was an organic system. So there's compost and cover crops with no pesticides. The other one was a conventional system. So by that, we mean mineral nitrogen fertilizer. It gets pesticides. They both had comparable amounts of tillage. Going into this experiment, we already knew that the system with compost and cover crops, the organic system, had a lot better soil health indicators compared to mineral fertilizer. It had more mineralizable carbon. It had more mineralizable nitrogen. It had more aggregation. It had more microbial biomass. It had more enzyme activity. It had a more neutral pH. And it had about 20% more total carbon. Um, and that graph, it's just the dark line on the top compared against the light gray line all the way on the bottom. So we knew that there were differences between these plots already. So we were like, well, there's probably a difference in the microbial community as well, given that microbes power a lot of these like indicators. So let's look at how it's changed. In that 20 year comparison between a system with compost and cover crops and a system with just mineral fertilizer, what did the microbes say? The official result was that when we looked at the soil microbes as a whole, we saw no differences in community structure or overall function. Translated, the overall, <laughs> the microbial communities between the two systems after 20 years of compost and cover crops look, versus mineral fertilizer look pretty much the same. 
So this is weird because we know there's a difference. Like we came into this knowing that there was a difference between these two systems. Why is the metagenome not telling us the same thing? It's like asking a crowd um, their opinion. What we had was a large crowd of microbes. When we looked at the overall soil, we're asking all of the microbes, how have things changed for you? And a lot of them are yelling, ah, nothing has changed. But turns out there are a couple microbes that were whispering and saying, actually, yeah, like a couple things have changed for me. So when we asked more targeted questions, we were like, all right, let's just look at carbon breakdown specifically. We actually saw that the system that had compost and cover crops had greater potential for carbon breakdown, because remember, DNA is just potential. Um, and it basically confirmed what our soil health measurements were saying. Now, a quick aside, carbon breakdown is not necessarily a bad thing. I know that there's all this talk about increasing carbon storage in soils. Microbes are the eye of the needle through which carbon, you know, plant residues must pass to become soil organic matter. The, this carbon breakdown is, you know, increased carbon breakdown is beneficial because it means that those plant residues get broken down faster and incorporated into carbon cycling and hopefully stored. You're not gonna store plant residues by themselves. You're gonna store them really well after they've been broken down by microbes and associated with minerals in the soil. So when we ask the microbes, well, how has my land management changed you over time? The answer depends on the questions that you ask. If we ask the very broad question, did my soil microbial community change after 20 years of management? very small or no change because there's a lot of microbes yelling, ah, you know, nothing has really changed for me. But if we zoom in and we ask a specific subset, just the microbes that break down carbon, hey, have things changed for you due to management? The answer is yes. And that gives us a really good idea of the types of questions that you can ask when you want to do these like soil metagenome tests. It is really difficult to answer a very broad question such as how is my microbial, you know, how is my soil microbial community doing? It's a lot easier to answer targeted questions like, hey, does my soil have more potential for carbon breakdown, especially when those questions are backed up by other measurements? It's also really hard to get clear management recommendations out of these metagenome tests because they just are not that reliable. We don't know enough about them yet. So if you're doing, if you're looking at a metagenome test to be like, hey, should I spray for pests this year? It's not gonna give you a good answer. But if you have a more targeted question, what is this strange fungus that I see on my plants and what can I do to treat it? A metagenome test or a genetic test can give you a really good idea. So to summarize, Tests of the soil metagenome, these reports that look at all of the microbes in a soil sample and try to tell you about how the soil is doing, have a lot of uncertainty associated with them. They cannot tell you what will happen. They can only give you an idea of what there is potential for or what you should keep an eye on. They are best used to complement other measurements, not to replace them. They are not a sound basis for management decisions on their own, just because we do not know enough about how DNA, these measurements actually interact with management. But what they are incredibly useful for and what scientists use them for is learning more about your soil. If you choose to do one of these measurements, by all means, keep the results. Because number one, if you do the same test on that same soil five years later, you compare it to the previous result, it gives you a really good idea of how things have changed. They are an incredible learning tool and the potential for them to give clear indications of management is there. We are not there yet. It might be that in 20 to 30 years, we, we get there, but you know, it's, that's, and that's one of the reasons that uh, you know, people are very excited about this because the potential is very visible, but it's, it's not quite there yet. Also, if you are trying to answer a question using your soil metagenome, the more targeted the question and the more backed up by external measurements it is, the better.
And with that, um, I'm going to leave it off. I'd like to thank Brody and Scout Labs, um, Ulash Karas, who is a person who crunched a lot of this metagenome data, USDA Predoctoral Fellowship. A lot of the ideas in this talk came from a paper by Noah Ferrer, which is how microbes can and cannot be used to assess soil health. And they, it's a really good paper, very well written, but they really go into you know, why it's really hard to get microbial indicators. Um, and yeah, with that, I will pass it over to Karen. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I think you've given us an awful lot to think about. And I am curious, um, we didn't have too many questions coming in um, during the presentation. And I suspect that's reflective of people saying that they haven't used these tests. And so they are here to learn a little bit more about what they um, what they might be useful for. We have a lot of technical service providers, and I'm betting we have a good number of. Um, sorry, I'll turn my camera on. I'm betting we have a good number of um, CCAs who may be getting questions from their customers. Is this something I should do? They may be approached by uh, product salespeople who want to encourage them to add this kind of testing to their services they provide. So I want to get to that. Um, so I'll, I'll plant that seed with you. Um, but I'm going to get to the questions that we did get in the chat. Um, but I, I do want to make sure we get to that question of how would you think about advising people to find places where this would be worth exploring? And what would you look for in the test and in the um, promises of what the vendor is offering to help them evaluate what's a good choice of a test to use. But before, so you can chew on that, but at the same time, you have to multitask. And I'm gonna give you a couple questions that we did get in the chat. So the first one was an interesting one. It's something that's been very relevant in food safety discussions too. Um, how long does the DNA that you're detecting in a soil sample, how long does that persist? And can you differentiate between uh, a living organism or residual DNA from organisms that are no longer uh, functional because they're just bits of DNA. What's the longevity of that? Um, and a tag on to that is, is it correct to say you're basically measuring presence absence and not quantifying the amount of a given organism? So that 29% of the field that in which verticillium DNA bits were found that doesn't mean there was, you didn't indicate how much was in each. So now I'll let you address those two. Yeah, um, so I think it's a really great question. One of them kind of leads into the other. So how long does DNA stick around in the soil? You know, I can't give an exact answer for that, but it is. it can be longer than 10 years. Like that is that rough estimate that like, I have read about. Um, what happens is that a lot of that DNA is a very valuable resource, but it is also, again, very stable. It doesn't break down very easily on its own. And so, you know, soils as historians, the microbes uh, remembering what has happened to that soil is very literal. And if you are looking for these uh, DNA tests to provide you with an idea of like, what has happened to that soil, how has it changed? that's one of the benefits that DNA does stick around for a long time. It depends from soil to soil, however. Um, for the second part of that question, it is by looking just at DNA, you can't really tell, just, just DNA by itself, you cannot tell whether it's from a living organism or a dead organism. There are ways to probe DNA. We have, uh, you know, the sort of cutting edge now is using stable isotopes. So you use uh, a molecule that has a signal, organisms will incorporate that into their DNA and then you look for all the DNA that has that signal. And that gives you an idea of like what DNA comes from organisms that are alive and functioning. But just looking at DNA on its own, it's, you can't really tell if it's from a living or a dead organism. You know, we just kind of hope that it's all from living organisms. Um, so when it comes to measuring quantity, very often they, you know, there's not a there's a lot of research on how these tests of like um, pathogen abundance 
affect, like, you know, whether they actually affect how much plants get diseases. We are, you are quantifying it. You're, you're getting an idea of how much DNA associated with that organism is in the soil, but we don't know that very clearly, you know, I'm gonna say it again, we're getting an idea of how much DNA associated with that organism is in the soil. Does not mean it's from a living organism, just that it's there. There are, that there's one concept that there's like a threshold. So an organism can be present in the soil at sort of low levels. And once it reaches a particular threshold, that's when you have uh, increased risk for plant disease. It's, you know, that threshold likely differs from organism to organism, from disease to disease, and it will differ probably depending on the crop that you plant. So we don't have a really good idea of that yet, which is, you know, why it's important to sort of take all of this with a, a grain of salt, even though it, you know, often it looks like it's really clear cut my recommendations. Um, let me know if I got all of the, all the parts of that. Yeah, you covered a lot. And in the meantime, you're sparking new questions. So I'm okay. just gonna keep flowing with some of them that seem related to me. Um, another question had to do with how evenly distributed do you find um, results? So what's the variability across the field? And that tied into another question that we had a whole session to talk about thinking about a, a, a sampling protocol in many of our systems, we have, you know, like a tree row and a middle, and those are almost two different systems that you're managing. Um, and sampling, it's important to think about that. So um, there's there's a question about variability, and then I'm tagging on to that. When you think about pulling a sample for a test of this nature, um, how do you think about where and when you would sample, um, recognizing that at the end of a long dry period, there may have been different conditions that would trigger perhaps some additional decomposition or, or other impacts to the sample. Okay. Um, I'm going to go through them as I recall them, but if I forget, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to repeat the question. Um, so I think the one that I'll start off with is where and when to sample, because that's sort of directly, I've had direct interaction with that sort of with the data set that I am working with. Microbial communities, will vary a lot over time, over the time course of years. Um, we don't know as much about how they vary over the time course of an entire season. And so in our experiment, we sampled post-harvest because we wanted to make sure there were no issues with disturbance and fertigation and drip irrigation. We want to be like, it's just the systems, you know, we not even interaction, you know, interference from plant roots. Um, when you should sample to spot the biggest difference or when you should sample to get a really good idea again that's super dependent on what you know if you have uniform rainfall throughout the year and uniform temperature conditions probably you can sample at any time if you're in california probably sampling in the middle of august is going to be very different from sampling at like the beginning of march just because of the differences in water and so it's um it's important to be to, you know, whenever you sample, you just try to sample at the same time. You try to control for sampling time. Um, and it, it is, you know, it depends on the questions that you ask too. But if you're asking questions, how are these systems different when the soil is really dry? You just make sure you, whenever you're comparing samples, they're all sampled at the same time so that you can rule out the effect of changes in climate conditions. Um, when it comes to variability, there is a lot of variability in soil conditions. Um, to give you another metaphor, if a microbe were the size of a person, a two inch clump of soil would be roughly an 11 mile large like plot of land. And so if you think uh, the city of Davis or you know, a city in California, how much variation in people is contained within a 11 mile radius? That's, you know, gives you an idea of the difficulty in like talking about variability over scales because we are just not working on the same scale that microbes are working on. The when you're talking about sort of like a middle row, you know, I can imagine that the, the if you have a row of trees and you have a row of cover crops down the middle, 
The microbiomes taken from right underneath those spots, even though they're maybe two feet apart, might be completely different because plants will influence the microbes that are there quite a bit. And so all of this is issues of soil science that is not, a, is not surprising. That's why we, when, you know, I, I think Jessica Chiartas had that whole talk about sampling um, and making sure to try to get a representative sample. We do our best to take samples from many different spots. We do our best to sort of consolidate. And we hope that just through consolidating and randomizing and getting a small sample out, that we will get a representative look at the microbial community. But that is a hope. That is not, is not clear that we actually do that, especially since when you extract DNA, you use 0.25 of a gram usually. That is like, that is such a small amount of soil that could fit on your fingertip. So, you know, that, that variability, the variability potential is huge. Um, so I want to throw yeah. a little curveball at you, Daniel. And, yeah. you know, there's a lot of interest and in the CDFA is supporting application of compost. Mm -hmm. um, when you import a carbon um, based soil amendment, are you not importing um, a good bit of genetic material that is now going to enter into your sample? So would you want to think about um, characterizing the history of management so that you would capture that? Yeah. In, in uh, reference to your timing of your sample. Yeah, I, you know, it, it, yeah, you sampling right after any disturbance, whether it's adding carbon or it's after killing, would probably affect what it is you get, like the data that you get back from it. Um, this actually highlights sort of one aspect of this question. It highlights a really interesting discussion in um, soil science, which is that if you take a microbe from one place and you move it to another place, does that microbe survive, right? And that is that comes into play a lot when you're talking about biological soil amendments or when you're talking about compost or stuff like that. And the answer is we don't, you know, again, we don't really know. I would say that from our results, we added compost for 20 years and we added four tons per hectare. Compost has a lot of microbial DNA, has a lot of microbes. We did not see a big difference in the microbial community associated with that compost addition. And so if there are changes that occur, those changes are not super big, we think. But, you know, there's just not a lot of, that, that's just talking from like our experiment, you know, again, there, it depends on the soil, which I feel could be the answer to every question. It depends on the soil, it depends on the soil. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm going to give you an easy one. I'm going to yeah, give go you ahead. an easy one now. You can take a break. How much <laughs> does a cloth like this test? It sounds expensive and then a very scared emoji face. So you want to give us sort of a range? Um, I, I don't know off the top of my head. I have seen prices up between 100 to 200 bucks per sample. Um, it's, it's very expensive. Like when we do it, it is very expensive. Um, to, to, to actually sequence DNA because it's a very specialized machinery. And it's not just, it's not like half of it is sequencing and the other half is the assembly and the, com the paying for the computing power that it takes to put that together and paying for like the, 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 the programs and all of that and then translating it into a report. All of that is like fairly resource intensive. So what I've seen are between 100, 200 bucks. I've seen maybe over 200 bucks, but you know, I'm not, I, I'm not like an expert on that. That's like a ballpark figure. So uh, I'll, I'll tag you in for, um, a, it's a somewhat, to me, it seems a somewhat related question. We have existing tests of um, soil respiration, which is not an indication of who's down there. It's an indication of activity because you're measuring basically the microbial meta metabolic process, the output from that. Um, so can you speak to um, what is, I think, I know the answer is that you're trying to characterize what kinds of organisms are generating that activity, but in terms of practical value, can you speak to the different value of a soil respiration test versus identifying who's down there generating that activity? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. So I will give you my tier. To, to, to preface, I am not a grower. I come from a farming family, but I am I'm not a grower. My, I don't grow farm myself. Things that I would trust 
in telling me about my soil. Number one would be, I have looked at residue in this soil for 30 years and I have a pretty good idea of how long it takes that residue to go away. That's like farmer intuition. That'd probably be like the first thing. The second thing, if I'm trying to figure out how fast residue gets broken down is that I would look at um, the, these soil mineralizable carbon tests because those are a measure of microbiotivity and they give you a pretty good idea of how stuff is broken down. Third, if I had not, if I had looked at the other two and they hadn't given me a clear answer, if I can't look at the other two, then you go to the metagenome test because honestly, these me direct measures of activity are way better than genomes that we're trying to, so, you know, we're adding an extra step on. We're like trying to look at the metagenome, relate that to activity, and then we relate that to like management, which is an extra step. It's much easier just to look at management and like, the, you know, to, to look at the activity. Um, but the reason that we do it, the reason it's so good is that instead of just doing one, you know, when you look at respiration, that's one test. You take time to do that one test. When you look at a metagenome, you can get potential answers to like a lot of different questions, just not super reliable. Yeah. Sorry, I think you're muted again, Karen. Oh yeah, yeah. sort of my, my brain power. I don't have that right brain power. Um, so there's a couple of them that are really practical in nature and I wanna toss these in there and make sure we get time to them. Uh, for them. One is, um, I'm guessing this might be from a, 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 a CCA or similar. So how do we, how do we as professionals present this kind of opportunity to the people who are farming? Like, is it ready for that? Is it ready for people to invest at the level of a hundred, two hundred dollars a test with high variability? Um, is it ready for prime time, so to speak? Are there instances in which it might be particularly useful, perhaps in its whistleblower function, um, or maybe in its historical ability to put some history um, and, and track that history? But so the question specifically are, are there any particular tests that you think are um, more ready for prime time and practical use than others? Are there others that might get at similar information for a land manager? And if so, which ones? And then just kind of the big question, like should we be presenting this to growers and other management professionals as ready for practical use? Um, and if so, what's the message? What's the simple back of the envelope message? Yeah. Um, so I will say, I'll preface this answer by saying that whenever I give a presentation or I talk about soil microbes or I talk to growers, the question I always get, how, are my, like, how do I tell how my microbials are doing? Like, how do, I, how do I know if my microbials are doing well? Like, what else can I be doing to help my soil microbes? And you, these tests provide, you know, they, 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 are, they, they present potential to do that. But, you know, if the question is, are they ready for prime time? And if by prime time, we mean, are these tests ready to tell us to give us recommendations on what we can do to improve our soil microbes, the answer is probably no, not yet. But a couple situations in which it might, I'll present a couple potential situations in which it might be useful. Number one, you have a, you have a problem, you have a particular pest or disease and you can't figure out what it is. Right, and that is something that has been presented, but you know that 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 is cited as like a good example, because the metagenome does not do it, it's very broad. You can ask, you can get a lot of things that maybe you didn't think about from the data. It's really good as like a last resort option. It's like I have looked at all of these other in uh, tests that maybe have better interpretations, or we have we're more familiar with interpreting them. And I still can't figure out what is going on. So okay, look, maybe I try a metagenome test, and maybe I see, maybe it pop, maybe something, you know, a strong signal pops out. Um, the other one is if you again microbes as historians, microbes giving you an idea of what is happening in the soil and how things have changed over time. If you want to learn more about your soil. Um, and it's, you know, there's like, I want to learn, I, I, I'm comfortable with where my microbes are. I don't want to use it to make management recommendations. I just want to know more about it. I want to know more about how it works. I want to get a better idea. 
these tests can be quite useful if you rem again that there's highlighted that they are learning tools and again if you do multiple tests over years you can get a really good idea of how things have changed according to management and that in itself is a valuable tool But just to be clear, again, not in a quantifiable manner, correct? Yeah. You're still detecting um, presence absence. So well, well, if you're you... hoping, for example, to eradicate um, a yeah. disease, that's a different <laughs> process. It's a, it's a different process. So like, um, again, uh, to, be, to be clear, you are quantifying. It is, you are quantifying, you're saying, I, I, I have this amount of DNA associated with this organism. But what you cannot say is that I have a lot of DNA associated with this organism, so that means I'm gonna have an outbreak, right? There's this, there's a gap between quantifying DNA and having an idea of who is there and relating that to like function, like what actually happens. Okay, so that's actually a clarification. You are quantifying population size to a certain extent. Yes, no? You're, quali you're quantifying DNA. So it's, again, the, the, it's, DNA is not population size because again, it's, it can be from dead microbes. It can be like relic DNA, right? So you are quantifying DNA. That does not mean that you get a good idea of how many of those living organisms are in the soil and you don't get a good idea that like they're going to do what you expect them to do. But you are, right. you are, you, you get a number, you get like there are, nine petagrams of DNA associated with, you know, in this sample. So that's tricky. Uh, it's to it is, it is, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's very, there's a lot of nuance associated with it. And it's, it's, it's not super clear, which is why I think that, which is why I, it was like, the, the, this talk was important because hopefully that people have a better idea of the nuance associated with it. Sure, yeah. So which, if you're looking for an assessment of pest pressure or disease pressure, you would have to have some sort of um, judgment connected to that kind of, of use of the data. Yeah, exactly. Like, the, you know, the, unfortunately, you know, I am not a pest expert, but it seems to me from that, unfortunately, the best way to tell if you have pest pressure is to measure if you have the actual, like, how much of the plot you have diseases, and that's like the most reliable measure of disease pressure, unfortunately. <laughs> Not popular with high value specialty crop growers. Yeah. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to toss a, a somewhat interesting and novel question at you. So um, one of our participants is an air quality specialist and is wondering, is there any sort of nexus um, using the information you can gain from metagenomics analysis to have some insight into um, soil-borne air pollutant emissions. So methane, um, the NOx, CO2, et cetera. It's okay mm. to say it's not there yet. You don't have to have an answer to everything, but. <laughs> <laughs> it is, I would say that it is not there yet. The answer to pretty much everything, if, if, if you are trying to relate this data to a like quantifiable, like, like real world impact, like this is what happens, the answer is more than likely it is not there yet, right? Um, yeah, we we look at genes. We you know I I I talk about potential for denitrification, but that's all I can do. I can talk about potential. I can't relate it back to like, look, there are more knocks coming off of these plots. There's more N2O coming off of these plots. Like it's not a clear link. Okay. Very good. Fair enough. Um, okay. So this is another one that comes up a lot. There are a lot of products that are um, added or, or, or sold as products that will in some way either um, shift your microbial populations or amplify their benefit in your systems. So what do you know about um, peer reviewed research that shows efficacy of adding um, more microorganisms to, to impact their role in the soil and as nutrient cyclers was the example in the question. 
I have looked and I have not found a lot of research is the short answer to that question. Um, I, yeah, I, the second most popular question after how do I help my microbials is, you know, I have this product, will it help? I'm like, mm, I don't actually know. Yeah, I can't, I can't say yes or no. I can say that compost has a lot of microbes in it. It has a lot of DNA in it. We added compost to a plot for 20 years. We did not see huge changes, but it doesn't mean that you need to see huge changes to have an effect. And so if, you know, it might be that some of them have like, have an effect, but I have not seen any research that says yes or no otherwise. So this is a um, number of years back, I worked with some Salinas Valley um, ag folks who, uh, it, the, the example was a gentleman who said that he gets somebody in his office at least once a week trying to sell him the next product that'll make his hair grow back, his crops double in yield and his profits, you know, triple. And um, we worked together to come up with what questions might he ask those vendors to um, screen those products. Um, what might he ask of them to allow him to evaluate it? So the question in the chat was, um, how would you advise companies that are, you know, marketing these kinds of products to um, frame them, to structure the information they're able to ask, to, to offer that would provide practical information? Is there something in the in the way it's done or um, the analysis it's done that would make them of greater practical value. And, and I'll add to that, where do you see the next um, advances in this technology going? That is a really good question. So we have had this discussion in our lab in, in trying to like talk about what would, what would be um, a better report the thing is, is that what these companies are doing actually needs to be done. The only way that we're going to get better at telling the connections between changes in microbial metagenomes and you know, microbial communities and actual effects from like land management are get, is getting more data. So we need to get more data. We need to like drop, you know, be able to draw more comparisons. Um, I would say that the microbial metagenome cannot it does it is not you cannot interpret it in the absence of like the soil environment right and so um i would say that if you had a test that like just looks at the microbial metagenome and gives you results just based on that but they haven't they have no you know if you have no idea of like what is the carbon content of your soil and like what are her here are these other you know here are all these other what's the ph like what are all of these other indicators that have a very strong effect on microbial community but um you know we they, they, those are never included in any report like i very rarely see them right and so they these microbial measurements right now are me are complementary that is their best thing you you know they're not the sole resource for management decisions they are complementary to other measurements that we have we know a lot about um and so, yeah, I mean, if they would like the opinion of a sixth year PhD student, yes, that, you, you know, if it would be somehow incorporating measurements of like other measurements into those reports, um, so that it's not just looking at the microbiome like on its own. Where do I see it going in 30 years? Everything depends on the database. If we have a really nice database with a lot of organisms and is really clearly identified what they do and we have really clear connections between like how changes affect them, you know, we can, we have so much more power and we are building that database by leaps and bounds. And so right now it's not necessarily in the state that it can be used easily, but you know, again, that's this is why everyone's so excited about it because it's a problem of just getting, you need more, we need both more data and we need like experiments that like draw these connections between that and like actual changes in the environment. Yeah, it, it's tricky, eh? <laughs> um, so there was one question, I think it, I would characterize this as a clarifying question. So were you able to look at 
stored samples from early days of the Russell Ranch um, mm -hmm. farm to characterize the um, the metagenomic data mm -hmm. from early on. We wanted to, but um, yeah, we did. We did not. Yeah, the, the short answer is no. We did not. We tried. We wanted to, but they, it just wasn't. We weren't able to get access to those samples, and so um, that would have been a much better experiment. But as it is, what we presented was a comparison between two systems that presumably started in the same place, had different management. How did they diverge? So, Yeah. There's a few questions here. They're all kind of um, sampling. We're back to sampling. And as mm -hmm. you know, I mean, the reason we had Jessica do that session on thinking about sampling and kind of creating a, a framework into which you would insert your research question and understanding of your of your cropping system or your, your your natural system that you want to describe in some kind of thoughtful, deliberate manner. So there's a few things that people are asking. I'm going to read them all to you, and then um, you can tackle them. So one is um, depth depth of sampling. Is there a particular depth? Because clearly microbial activity tends to be um, mm -hmm associated with where there's carbon. So thinking about that. So what's the depth the soil sample should be collected to get an accurate DNA analysis or perhaps a representative DNA analysis might be a good way to frame it. Um, and then even with a targeted question approach, you know, are, do I have good decomposers present in my population or whatever? Um, is it helpful to um, look at how a uh, a production area is performing, so to speak, and try to get a benchmark against that local region. So for example, if you're concerned about a particular function in your soil community that you think is related to say decomposition, choose a sample where you're seeing slow breakdown of crop residue versus fast breakdown of crop residue and try to use your own internal reference, so to speak. Um, and then the last question related to this is, how do you separate interannual changes and sampling variability from historical changes in microbial community? And I'm, I think you probably have more than enough to address, and I'll stop there. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll let you think a minute while I just say something um, with mm -hmm. regard to your, um, you know, carbon cycling. I think it's important to think about the soil performs functions for us. And when we talk about soil health, we're really talking about is the soil um, doing the things that we hope it will do? So for example, because of the matrix the soil provides for decomposition, we're cycling carbon. And what we're really looking for is to optimize the stability of the carbon in the soil matrix, right? So understanding that helps us think about um, when we evaluate soil, what is it that it's doing or not doing that we want to optimize? I bought you some time. Okay. Off yeah, you go. that's perfect. Um, so I will say the advice that I have on sampling is the same advice that my PhD advisor gives me when I start a new experiment. And that is, what is your question? Right? Like it, the, the, where you sample and how you sample and when you sample are dependent on the question that you want to answer, right? And um, for, you know, very often, so yeah, I, so I can't give you like a rubric that you should follow, like, hey, always sample at the surface, always sample lower. If you want an idea of how your, your, your crop management effects have been affecting like, you know, microbial communities deeper in the soil, then you sample deeper. Uh, very often people sample, sample in the top zero to 30 centimeters because that is where the most microbial activity is taking place. Um, and that's where a lot of the roots are. And so that's, you know, because that is such an active region, the stuff that happens there can be very important for plant growth. And so, you know, that's why people will focus on the soil surface very often. But I mean, we sampled down to a meter and we found changes sort of throughout the entire profile. And so really where you sample, when you sample, 
depends on the question that you want to answer. Uh, on that same note, how do you separate sort of interannual variability from historical sampling? The way we deal with that is we just try to sample at the same time every year. So if you have your sampling in multiple years, you try to just pick the same time point every year. And hopefully that kind of like smooths out the variation because you're getting, you're hitting it at the same point in that cycle. Um, and finally, benchmarking against a local region. That is a very good question. I don't know. Um, that is, I mean, yeah, I can I, I, I <laughs> if you want, what you want, like, again, it depends on what you want to get out of that data. So if it's like, I want to know if my soil microbial community is breaking down carbon faster relative to like other farms in my, um, the other farms in my area. The first way to answer that question is I would look at carbon restoration or I would talk to people and be like, you know, just like how fast the residue is broken down, right? But if you're like, no, I want to do a metagenome test, then the best thing to do would be to get a minute to, to do a, to do that test on both of those samples, right? To like, to be able to like directly compare them. If they're too far apart, like sometimes if things change, it's really hard for, I'm, I'm really just getting into the area of speculation there, but metagenomes should not really be your first resort when you're asking, like you're trying to get at like questions of function, I think is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Oh, you're muted, sorry. That's very clear and, and, and helpful. Thank you, Daniel. Um, there's another question that came in as you were answering with regard to um, handling the sample once it's collected before it is sent for analysis. So the, sample, the question is in the chat. It says soil mm -hmm. sampling for metagenomic analysis requires um, kind of special conditions to store the soil before analysis. And is it possible for um, you know, a, a farmer to sample, handle, get that chain of custody all the way to the lab without compromising the integrity of the analysis? Basically, you can read it in the chat if it's easier to read it the way it was framed, but I think that's mm -hmm. the question. Yeah. Um... DNA is pretty stable. Um, you definitely like, okay, so if, if the ideal thing to do would be to have a little freezer that you carried with you and to take so a sample and put it directly into the freezer. Because what you're, what you're trying to do when you freeze it is you are trying to preserve that soil at like the moment you took it out of your field so that the results are, 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 are true to what is actually happening in the field. If you take the soil out of the field, put it into a plastic bag and then sort of leave it on a kitchen table, what your metagenome results are going to show you are what that soil, like what are the, what are the effects to that soil of like being left in a you know, closed environment on a kitchen table. And so that's why, why we freeze. Um, I believe that each one of these companies sort of will give you an idea of how to store your samples. My best estimate, if you don't have a negative 80 degree freezer, which, you know, who does, um, you stick it in your freezer as soon as possible. Very often when we transport samples, we try to transport them on dry ice to make sure they stay frozen. Um, yeah, and that's, yeah. So that, I, it, you want it to be frozen so that it is accurate to the conditions you took it from. Um, but depending on the test you do, that company will probably give you much better idea of what to do. Thank you, Daniel. And we are almost at the, at the end of our time. There are, um, I think we've addressed most of the questions. Um, Daniel, uh, if, if you are welcome, if you welcome questions, I'm sure that your email will find you. And um, I wanna make sure we leave time here for our host for the session to wrap it up and give our CTA participants an opportunity to get their um, their credits logged with the barcode. So I will say thank you very much to Daniel. Being on the hot seat is really hard. And um, he came on telling us that this is a, 
still evolving opportunity to understand what's happening in the soil. And so I think we've learned today that, you know, watch it, look for opportunities. I hope that the army of private consultants out there are, you know, doing what I think of most of you are doing today, which is educate yourself. Make sure you know um, what it will do, what it will not do, and um, probe those who are offering these services and these tests to understand to the best of their ability to explain to you, what are you going to get out of it? What's, what's this offer, practical management guidance? So Hannah and Jennifer, I will sign off and hand it back to you. Thank you so much, Karen and Daniel, especially, and all of you that participated in the chat. Um, please do reach out to myself or Jennifer if there's any um, questions that come up for you in the next day or two. We can certainly move those along to, to Daniel. Um, so I just want to finish up with that last poll that I promised everybody, kind of looking at um, whether this uh, presentation moved you closer to um, thinking about pursuing the tests or not. So if you just take a couple seconds to fill this out for us. Okay, Jennifer. Okay, so we have uh, either stayed the same or moved the needle on about 80% of folks and um, convinced uh, nearly a fifth of folks that perhaps uh, this is not a solution that they would like to explore. So all is well and good, this is why education exists, so we can all continue to reevaluate these important decisions. So um, thank you again on behalf of CARTV and all of the um, California Farm Demonstration Network entities that you see here on the bottom of this slide. Um, as I mentioned, we should have a lot coming up for you, uh, including the release of our California Farm Demonstration website and ideally more programming or ways to get involved in the next couple months. So we will um, be blasting listserv, social media, et cetera. And you can feel free to get in touch with me if you'd like, if you haven't heard um, about these events and you wanna know what's going on, I'm, I'm always available.